the last class, the last case for this class uh, is Dennis v. United States. And we've jumped forward a, a significant amount of time, um, 26 years, in fact. Um, an important intervening notion here is that we have to deal with the fact that World War II has happened. It's come and gone. And also, the federal government has passed a law that looks very similar to the criminal anarchy statute that New York passed. Congress in 1940 passed what is known as the Smith Act. And the Smith Act is a federal law that prohibited the teaching or advocating the violent overthrow of the U.S. government. So it was, in essence, the criminal anarchy statute um, from New York that the court had upheld. Um, and so that law is actually at issue in this case. So the facts of this case, the defendants in this case, Dennis and others, uh, were leaders of the United States Communist Party who were charged with conspire to organize the Communist Party and to advocate the overthrow of the U.S. government by force. Obviously, they asserted their First Amendment rights um, to engage in the speech. The Supreme Court in this case uh, disagrees and upholds the convictions. So the issue in this case is the actions undertaken by Dennis and his conspirators um, with regard to formulating a U.S. Communist Party um, protected actions under the First Amendment. The majority here, 25 years after Gitlo, says yes, but they say yes in a very different sort of fashion. Um, the decision is more centered around the first, the decision, the majority decision is more centered around the First Amendment and at least seems to use or borrow from the reasoning of Holmes of Brandeis in those earlier cases 26, year, 26 years plus ago. So the majority in this case held that the clear and present danger is absolutely applicable in this case. So remember, clear and present danger, clear and present danger is used in Shank. It's not used in Abrams, and it's not used in Gitlo. Gitlo, it's almost essentially ignored. But this court absolutely applies that test. So we had a test that was treated positively in the first case, ignored in the second case, ignored in the third case, and brought up in the fourth case. And the only reason why that precedent probably stayed vibrant um, is because of the dissents of Holmes and Brandeis, which really advocated and rallied for the use of the clear and present danger test. Uh, so the clear and present danger test, the majority says, is absolutely applicable in this case. However, the violent overthrow of the United States government is a sustainable interest of the government that Congress may protect against. So this is the language of, uh, of the court. In each case, courts must ask whether the gravity of the evil, discounted by its probability, justifies such an invasion of free speech as it is necessary to avoid the danger. That's this court speaking. So it very much sounds like Holmes's dissents that held on. You've got to measure what they're advocating for against the likelihood of it occurring. This court is very much using that language. In this case, the court argues, however, that the danger was real and it comes within the standard of clear and present danger. And therefore, it confirms these, confirms these, wow, affirms these convictions. It seems that they use the reasoning of Holmes and Brandeis, but most likely don't come to the same conclusion that Holmes and Brandeis um, would have come against or what, what it would have, would have sided with. And I think the reason for that is this overwhelming fear of communism that's going on in the 1950s, uh, 1940s, 50s, and 60s. Um, this is a t around the time uh, uh, of McCarthyism. Um, McCarthy being a, uh, a member of Congress who, who went after communists with reckless abandon using things like the House uh, Un-American Activities Committee to investigate communists and, and, and basically out them um, publicly. So this decision is very much in that vein with a fear of communism. Uh, there was thought to be at the time this sort of undercurrent of communism all throughout the United States. 
whether that was real or imagined, you have to have a historian weigh in on that. Um, one thing that was clear is it was at least a little bit overblown. Um, but in this case, occurring right at the same time that all this is going on, a majority of the court says that, well, Communist Party is arguing for a, a, a violent overthrow of the United States government. Um, when you couple that with the fear individuals had of communism and also the suspectness that your friends and neighbors could be communists, um, for them, that was a clear and present danger to, to squash the speech in this case. Justice Frankfurter concurs in the outcome, um, doesn't use the clear and present danger test, in fact, signals of something that will come later, and says the case represents a balancing of free speech and national security. And that is something that legislatures, not courts, should be deciding. So you have to balance this out, and the legislature should determine when that goes too far. Justice Jackson also concurs in this case. He says that the clear and present danger test is, is fine for a case in which it arose, like Shank, um, but not in this one. Like the clear and present danger test shouldn't be used here, um, in which the time would be too late for the government to act, so the test shouldn't apply. So his argument is, is nuanced. Um, if an individual is advocating to overthrow the government and you're choosing to prosecute them, well, if they're successful in what they're advocating for, you don't have a chance to prosecute them because the government has already been overthrown. Justice Jackson was a nuanced man. Um, his argument ultimately rests on the hinge that an individual can't claim the protections of the First Amendment while simultaneously advocating for the overthrow of the U.S. government, which, you know, not a problematic argument. There, there are a couple dissents here, um, and, and they're, they're different dissents, so I want to, again, spend some time with them. First off, Justice Black dissents. Uh, and Justice Black says that there should be absolutely no balancing of the First Amendment's protections against national security. Shouldn't happen. Because when a court, for when courts balance with the First Amendment against reasonableness, the First Amendment gets watered down. Now, when I said in the first few cases that there was no absolutist point of view, no one was arguing that Congress shall make no law means Congress shall make no law. Enter Justice Black. Justice Black is that absolutist. When he sees Congress shall make no law, his mind goes, any law. So the fact that there exists this law, the Smith Act, it is repugnant to him to the First Amendment of the Constitution because Congress should not be making any law which abridges speech. Any at all. No laws whatsoever should abridge speech for Justice Black. He's a textualist, absolutist. He does not see exceptions. A colleague who joins him in dissent sort of disagrees with that, with that argument. That's Justice Douglas. He 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 argues very clearly that, hold on, the First Amendment's freedoms are not absolute. They're, they're, they're just not. Thank you, Justice Black, for weighing in. Um, but the thing is, there's no evidence that there was conspiracy taking place. And yet conspiracy is absolutely what these defendants are accused of. And so in the absence of evidence to convict, you simply can't do it. So the, his dissent is not so much on the First Amendment side of things, outside of saying that the First Amendment's not absolute. His, his, his dissent focuses more on what the individuals in this case are actively charged with and the fact that there exists no evidence that they conspired to see the events they advocated for take place. And for him, that's the linchpin that their convictions should be overturned. Um, but what we have is we've jumped forward 25 plus years, um, and, and the court has learned the language 
of Holmes and Brandeis. It's learned the idea that you have to weigh um, the risk of the actions being advocated for versus the likelihood of them occurring. But they don't seem to come down on the side that Holmes and Brandeis would have intended. And those individuals that are in dissent are dissenting in very different ways than Holmes and Brandeis did. Black is just saying, no, Congress can't make laws which restrict any speech. And Douglas is making a very nuanced argument about conspiracy. So it's weird in that the voices of Holmes and Brandeis have been shifted from a dissenting opinion to a majority opinion, but the outcome of what the cases were in terms of whether these laws restrict free speech are exactly the same. So the first four cases, despite who's writing the opinion, despite what they're articulating, whether they're using the clear and present danger test, whether they're not using the test or whether they're using Holmes's and Brandeis's argument that you have to weigh these things uh, on, on sort of a, a, a scale to come up with or whether it's actually a clear and present danger, no matter how you're doing it, over this over 40 year period, it doesn't matter. The Supreme Court has been consistent in saying that governments can restrict speech for reasons of national security. 